grabs a flip-flop or like the wooden spoon, <laughs> you know, or, or the belt or something like that, right? And then it's like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't think this would actually happen. I'm so, 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 so. And then all of a sudden, then like this fear sets in where it's like, oh, no, now I'm really in trouble and I didn't think I would actually get in trouble. And so there's a, there's a particular um, an anime series, shout out to the weebs out there, that um, is one of, it's one of my favorite TV shows ever, and it's called Attack on Titan. And uh, if, if you don't know what it is, let me explain what the show is. So Attack on Titan is a show where basically all of humanity is, is been contained behind these sets of 50 meter high walls because there are these monsters called titans that eat human beings. And the humans can't stop them, and so what they do to survive is they, they build up these 50 meter high walls to keep the titans out and so that they can stay safe inside the city. And so everyone has been living in safety for over 100 years, and people are convinced the walls will never fall. But then there's people that have been like, actually, the walls won't last forever. Actually, we are in danger. Actually, we have committed these like terrible sins, and we should be scared because judgment is coming, and the walls will fall down. But the government and all the people that are living inside the walls don't believe it. And so that's where the first episode picks off, and I want to show you guys a quick clip. So check this out. People for 100 years had been living in safety, claiming no one will ever destroy the walls. We will be safe forever. And all of a sudden, when everyone least expects it, the walls come crashing down and uh, a lot of people die. And humanity is in danger. And I share that clip because that anime is so similar to the story of the Bible. And so in the Bible, in the time of Israel, so after King David, after King Solomon, all of their descendants had been kings for a long time. And Israel, who had been called to, to uh, you know, be a symbol of God's kingdom on earth and to live according to God's commandments... Over years, they had started to slip, and they had started to fall into sin over and over and over again. And the kingdom was just getting worse and worse and worse. And all the while, God's prophets are speaking to Israel, saying, if you keep doing this, an invading nation is going to come. They are going to destroy the walls surrounding Jerusalem, and an invading army will kill our people, and our people will be exiled into Babylon. And you know what? Israel said, nah, it's never going to happen. They didn't listen to the warnings of the coming judgment. And sure enough, we know from history, judgment came. Babylon comes in, destroys the wall surrounding Jerusalem, and all of God's people are exiled from their homeland. Thousands of people are killed. And the prophet Zephaniah was prophesying that this exact thing would happen. That people needed to be warned and prepared for God's day of judgment. But see, thousands of years later, we can look at the story and say, what about us? Have we heeded the warning? Are we prepared for the day of judgment? Or are we like the people of Israel that say, no, that's never going to happen? Are we like humanity in, in Attack on Titan? Oh, the walls will never come crashing down, and we're totally unprepared for when that day happens. So how can we be prepared for the day of judgment? Well, the prophet Zephaniah, who was one of these prophets that was speaking to Israel at this time, Zephaniah chapter 3 is what we're going to read tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 3. And what we're going to look at, we're going to look at God's judgment. But then we're also going to look at God's delight. And then we're going to look at how we should respond. 
So the first thing that I want us to see tonight is this, that God's judgment will be poured out on those who rebel, on those who defile, and those who oppress. God's judgment will be poured out on those who rebel, defile, and oppress. Let's pick up in Zephaniah chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And this is what the prophet Zephaniah has to say. He says, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. And we can just stop there for a second because Zephaniah is lining up the, the judgment that God is pronouncing against the people of Israel. Notice there's, there's three key words in this section on here. It says those who are rebellious, defiled, and oppressing in that first verse. Rebellious, defiled, and oppressing. Now these words are all words that are, that are describing what sin is. So sin is a rebellion against God. Ever since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they were rebelling against God. Sin defiles us. You know, we were once pure and our sin defiles us. And then it, sin oppresses people. It oppresses you. It makes you a slave to sin. And it also oppresses other people. So your sin can oppress yourself and it can imp- oppress the people around you. So, you know, if you are someone who, say, struggles with uh, impure thoughts, well, you are a slave to your thought life. But if you're in a relationship with somebody, those thoughts come out in your actions. And all of a sudden, you're no longer enslaving yourself, but you're oppressing other people, right? But then in verse 2, in verse 2, notice what God says. He says, She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She accepts no correction. And here's the question that I have for us tonight. Are you someone who takes correction? And this is a question that I want you to be introspective and just think to yourself about for a moment. Are you somebody who, if if someone gives you a warning, maybe it's your parents or maybe it's, you know, your small group leader or someone, another adult at school or a teacher or whatever, if someone gives you a warning, are you someone who listens to that warning or not? If someone gives you, say, like feedback, right? Like if you are, you know, working on some uh, art piece, you know, or you are training, you know, you're a baseball player and your coach is like, hey, your swing is a little off and here's what you need to do to get better. Are you someone who, who takes correction well and learns and accepts that, or are you someone who rejects it? Are you someone who is unteachable, who doesn't want to listen to other people when they have feedback for them, right? Because if we aren't people who are teachable, if we aren't people who can take correction, we're never going to listen to the advice that could save our life. So, like, if there's an adult that is talking to you and is like, hey, you're making really poor decisions, are you someone who will listen to that person, or are you someone that says, who cares, and just rebels and does your own thing? And see, Israel, at this time, was was just like that. And so Israel and all the people that follow in Israel's footsteps place themselves in God's position. What do I mean by that? What I mean is is that people are preferring to trust themselves rather than God or rather than someone who has your best interest in mind who really cares about you. So if you have a parent that's like, hey, you need to do this to succeed and get your driver's license. You need to do these many hours. You need to make sure that you've got this, this, and this down. Otherwise, you're going to fail your driver's test. Are you someone that says, okay, you've taken a driver's test before. You have a driver's license. I'm going to listen to you, and I'm going to obey what you said. Or are you someone that says, I don't care. I'm going to do my own thing. It'll be fine. 
You're trusting in yourself rather than someone who's been through it, who really knows what's best for you, right? In the same way with God, if we are people that put our trust in ourselves, so we look at God's word or maybe you hear a sermon on Wednesday or Sunday morning or you see a Bible verse that someone shares on Instagram and you look at that and you're like, I don't know. I don't think that applies to me. I think I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. You're choosing to trust in yourself rather than trusting in God, right? You're putting yourself in God's position. So, I mean, kind of a silly example that I have of this is like um, trying to trust myself. I was, uh, when me and my wife moved into our apartment about a year ago, I got these like hanging wall shelves that like they just drill into the wall so you don't have a bookshelf, you just have like a floating wall shelf. And, um, you know, I had this idea of, okay, I'm going to get two of them and put them right next to each other so it'll be an extra long shelf so I can put, you know, more figures or whatever on there. And, um, you know, I had my whole plan laid out and like I wanted to do it on my own and I didn't want help. And so I get the first one in. It was kind of difficult, but I got it. I'm like, great. Now I just need to get the second one and just line it up perfectly. And I do all my measurements. And Katie's like, do you need some help? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I got this. And then I, you know, drill the holes in the wall. And I tried to, like, lower the shelf in. And it's, like, hitting up against the top of the other shelf right next to it. Like, doom, doom. And I'm realizing, oh, my gosh, I am, like, less than a centimeter off but I've already drilled holes in the wall <laughs> and now these shelves won't work. So now there's actually eight different holes in my wall <laughs> where the shelf is because I didn't want help because I didn't want to trust someone who knew that they were doing and I wanted to do it myself. And, you know, when we move out here in a couple of months, it's, you know, going to be difficult to get those all fixed up. Do you trust in yourself or do you put your trust in God? The second thing that I want us to see is that God's delight will be poured out on those whom he has redeemed. So we talked about God's judgment first, but here God's delight will be poured out on those whom he has redeemed. I want us to pick back up again in Zephaniah chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 9. And here's what it says. For at that time... I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove you from your midst, your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people who are humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. And let's just pause there for a second. So here's what God is saying. God is, has been pronouncing judgment against Israel, but he, wants, he doesn't want to commit an act of judgment. He wants to delight in them. He wants to redeem them. God's desire is not for judgment or to destroy, but it's to purify them and to redeem them. And so in, in, in these verses that we just read, God is saying that he's looking for people to humble themselves. That, that this judgment that's happening is not this judgment that's just to destroy people and, and let them, you know, that's just it. His judgment is like, is like putting a flame on a piece of gold that has all this dirt and all this excess rock and whatever that's on it because the gold needs to be purified. And God's judgment is not to just destroy but to purify them. And so he's looking to, to humble them. And then it picks up in verse 13. In verse 13 he says, Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none of them 
and, and none shall make them afraid. And so what God is saying here is this, that the redemption that is coming in light of this judgment, the redemption results in changed behavior. So God redeems us, he changes us, so then we can live differently. It's different than other religions where you have to work at it, and you've got to make sure that, that you check all the right boxes and that you do all of the religious rituals and that, that you do all of the right things and stop doing all the bad things, and then you can be saved and redeemed. God's message is, I will redeem you, and then you will change. God's redemption results in a changed behavior. And then he picks up in verse 14, and let's continue reading here. Verse 14, it says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day... It shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. And he will exalt over you with loud singing. Now, this is just a beautiful moment where God's been talking about judgment and Zephaniah has been prophesying about God's coming judgment. And here, it's like the Israel that is purified, that is redeemed, that God has purified us. He removes the punishment and pours out his delight. And it has this verse that says that he will, he will uh, quiet you with his love and he will exalt over you with loud singing. So we just got done with worship time, right? By the way, great, the worship team just does a great job every week, right? But like, you know, when we sing during worship time, we are singing praises to God, and we're worshiping him. And here, we actually have the reverse of that. We have God delighting in us it's like we sing something to God, and then God is like singing over us. That he's singing not only with us, but to us. It's this idea of like, you know, if you've got like a, a cheesy romantic comedy thing, and then like, you know, the guy is trying to win the girl, and he like sings her a song at the end or something, and it's this love song. And that's the image we have of God, that, it's, it's, that the image is no longer you know, the invading army that's going to destroy the wall and people are going to die. The image is that God loves us and is going to sing to us. I mean, talk about opposite here. But that it's just showing how much that God loves us. So his heart, his desire is not for judgment or destruction. His heart is for love and redemption. And then Zephaniah closes with the last two verses in verse 19. It says, Behold, at that time I will deal with all of your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at that time I will gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the people of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Now this is really important because what it shows is that God is redeeming, like in verse, uh, the first verse on verse 19, that he will redeem the lame and gather the outcast. So those, those who, are, who are injured, those who are weak, those who are handicapped, and then the outcast, those who have been cast away by society, those who never quite fit in with everyone else. Those are the people that God gathers and makes them the praise of the earth. 
And so what this is showing us is that, that God's kingdom is for everyone. God's kingdom is for the popular kid, and it's for the weeb table in, in the lunchroom. Am I right? God's, God's kingdom is for, you know, the academic scholars, and God's kingdom is for the gamers. God's kingdom is for the captain of the cheerleading team, and God's kingdom is for the, the you know, leader of the chess team or whatever it is. Like, God's kingdom is for everyone. And it doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. God's kingdom is for everybody. And so here's the thing, the next thing that I want us to see, that God's invitation is for you to come as you are. But it is also to come and be purified. God's kingdom is come as you are. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is invited. Every single person, God is calling you in this room and, and, and calling everyone to himself. It is very much come as you are. Even if you're sick, even if you're hurting, even if you're still sinning, even if you're, you're messed up and you feel like nobody loves you, God loves you and he is calling you to himself. The kingdom is open to everyone. It has come as you are, but it is also to come and be purified. There is a purification that happens when we trust in Jesus, when we give our allegiance to God. We don't just stay the same way. You come to Jesus as a sinner, broken and messed up and whatever, and then God purifies you. The idea is like, like Jesus when he sees the, the, the woman uh, at the well, or when Jesus uh, catches the woman who was caught in adultery. He says, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. It's a purification. And see, every other religion is like you have to be purified to come to God. You have to be cleansed to come to God. But the Bible is the opposite, that God calls the impure, the imperfect, the messed up, the lowly, the sinful, the diseased, the wicked, all of the people that just as they are, he calls them to himself and then he purifies them. So what are we supposed to do? Here's our call to action. We are called to live like those who are redeemed. We are not called to live the way that we used to live because God has been clear that there is a day of judgment that is coming. And even though you are saved once and for all when you trust in Jesus and your salvation is not going to be taken away from you, you don't lose your salvation. But there is still a day when we will all stand before God and give an account for what we have done. We will stand at what's called the Bema seat, at the judgment seat of Christ. And he will ask us, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the redemption that I purchased for you with my blood? What did you do with the gifts and talents and the opportunities that I gave you? And there is a day of judgment. So we are called to live like those who are redeemed and not keep living in, in our sin, in our impure ways. To not go back to lying all the time. To not go back to rebelling against our parents just because. But to live like those who are redeemed. So here's the thing. In, in Zephaniah 3, God talked about uh, rebellion, defilement, and oppression. And here's the deal. Rather than rebel, we should obey. Rather than rebel, we need to obey. And so the question that I have for you is, is how is God calling you into further obedience? Maybe you are someone who just deals with being disobedient to your parents. And I get it. Sometimes parents can get really annoying and, you know, they just get under your skin and it's irritating and you just don't want to listen to them regardless of what they say. It still happens no matter how old you get, by the way. 
doesn't matter if you're 30 or whatever, you will still get annoyed by your parents and not want to listen to them. But how is God calling you to obedience? Is he calling you to, rather than rebel, despite wanting to really, really badly, to say, you know what, even if I disagree with what you're saying, I'm going to listen to you. Or maybe it's, it's a rebellion that you deal with at school. And any type of authority, you know, whether it's don't run in the hallway or get off your phone or whatever it is, you just, it just makes you so irritated and so mad and you just don't want to deal with it anymore. And so any type of authority, you just want to blow off and not care about and not listen to them. Even if it's like not a big deal, you just have nothing to do with it. How is God calling you to obey. The next thing is, rather than defile, we should be pure. So the question is, how is God calling you into, into further purity? Whether it's, you know, impure thoughts, or maybe it's just being really selfish. Maybe you're impure because you want everything all the time immediately. And if you can't get what you want, you're grumpy and you're unhappy and no one should be around you. Or maybe it's, it's with anger. Maybe your anger just gets you so riled up that whatever it is, like everyone needs to keep like a 10-foot distance from you because no one needs to be close to you because you might hit somebody or scream at someone or fight with somebody. How is God calling you into further purity? And the last one is rather than oppress we should stand for freedom. Rather than oppress, we should stand for freedom. How is God calling you to stand for freedom? Are you somebody that, that makes fun of someone else because they're different? Are you someone who has bullied people in the past? Or are you someone who sees people being bullied at school and just stands by the wayside because you don't want to interfere? God's people do not oppress or stay silent about oppression. God's people stand up for freedom and they stand up against injustice. How is God calling you to stand for freedom? Or how is God calling you into a greater freedom in your life? Because sin enslaves us. And any kind of sin in your life, regardless of what it is, enslaves you. How is God calling you into greater freedom? What type of chains are there shackled around your ankles that are keeping you from living in the fullness that God has called you into? Maybe for you, it's this desperate need to always be in a relationship with somebody else. And you are codependent and you can't be alone and you feel worthless and insecure without that. God wants to set you free from being codependent. Maybe you have some type of an addiction or you've been messing with, with drugs or messing with vaping or whatever, and now you've got a nicotine addiction and you just don't know what to do. God wants to set you free from that because it is keeping you from living the fullness that he's called you to. So we are called to live like those who are redeemed. Rather than rebel, we need to obey. Rather than defile, we need to be pure. And rather than oppress, we should stand for freedom. We should live in freedom. But here's the deal. God is going to bring his judgment of sin on the world. He is. That day of judgment is coming. But God is also using judgment to purify. And while there is like, you know, an ultimate day of judgment when Jesus will return, there's also times of judgment in our own lives when you got to pay the piper because you've been messing up and you've been living in sin or maybe it's a secret or whatever it is and eventually it comes out and eventually you have consequences. No one ever gets away forever. No one avoids the consequences forever. There's always some story about some rich person in the news who like 
you know, even if it's like into their 60s and something comes out and it's like, oh my gosh, this person was a terrible person and they thought they were above the law and they were doing this for 60 years or whatever. Day of judgment's coming. But God is going to use that judgment to purify. So when you have something, when you have to, to deal with the consequences of your sin or your actions, God wants to use that as an opportunity to purify you. So, so if you are going through a difficult season in your life, if you are having to deal with consequences of something that you've done wrong or you something like that, God is working things together to purify you, to grow you in, 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 in your relationship with him and prepare you for eternity. And so if, you're, if you are someone who has trusted in Jesus, the call is to live like you've been redeemed. And if, there, if there's anyone in here who has never trusted in Jesus, it's time for you to be redeemed. It's come as you are. There's no judgment. There's no hatred against who you are for what you've done. God wants you to come to him as you are, and he wants to purify you. And so if you have never had that happen, tonight is the night. And so, God, I pray right now for every single uh, young man and young woman that's in this room, God, that uh, whatever these students are struggling with, God, that you would reveal in their heart and their mind something that needs to change. That you would reveal to them what you, the next step that you want them to take to grow closer to you. And God, if there is people in this room that, that have never trusted in you, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir in their hearts and awaken in them something that says, I need to get right with God. God, that you would give us a, a perspective that is looking towards the end, God, that is looking towards the day when you return, the day that we stand before you and give an account for what we've done. God, that you would, you would awaken in us a desire to please you above all else, to worship for an audience of one, to live our lives for an audience of one, you, King Jesus, and no one else. God, we thank you and we give you this time in Jesus' name.